It is Dominance MMA head Ali Abdelaziz. And Ali, I've been seeing a lot of you lately, so I wanted to get a chance to talk to you and catch up on it all. Uh, first, I saw you in Salt Lake City. Massive, massive win for Justin Gaethje taking out Dustin Poirier. Uh, I think maybe maybe Justin Gaethje's best performance to date, man. What did you make of uh, just how good he looked at UFC 291? Um, I think uh, the way uh, Justin looks around right now is, uh, is very scary for everybody. You know, um, I think... You know, he was winning some, losing some, and uh, he's just entertaining us, and he was worried about winning. And I think uh, him and uh, Trevor Whitman, and I believe he's one of the greatest coach of all the time, uh, the best mind. I know him for 20 years, one of the best people you can ever meet. I uh, went to the lab uh, and really worked on defense and about strat one fights, you know, and it's still entertaining, it's not boring. And it's still the highlight reel is still going, you know, and about a little bit smarter, a little bit wiser, a little bit older. And I think right now he's the scariest guy in the division for sure. He's the scariest lightweight in the world right now. Oh, I love it. He is looking amazing. Now there's a couple options. So here's a, clearly he's next in line for the lightweight title, right? He won the BMF belt. He's clearly the number one contender right now, but I did see him take the Twitter and he's sending some messages to Conor McGregor as well. We know there's a lot of money involved when Conor McGregor's involved. So what do you think makes sense? Is is he going to sit around and wait for this title fight or is he going to try to get something going with Conor McGregor? Listen, um, Justin Gage is a guy, of course, we it, it's a prize fighting. It's, it's, it's about money. But I, I feel you have to have a little bit of integrity. And this is what Justin and Trevor and the whole team is about, you know, just to, just to have some standard, you know. This this uh, McChicken have no standards, have no class. Uh, but if he want, you know, he I, I don't believe Conor McGraw ever fight again. Uh, but if he fight again, uh, he probably gonna fight somebody coming off loss, or uh, or just he 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 or talking. You know, first of all, for him to fight Justin Gaethje, he have to make 155 pounds. He have to be past multiple, multiple Sada truck tests because we know what he's been doing. I, I think, you know, I'm not going to go ahead and uh, accuse him because I never saw him. Uh, and plus, you know, if this is what he want, be part of his legacy, leaving out his stretchers, fighting Justin Gish and, and get stretch out out of the arena, let it be. But I feel he's not man enough. Uh, he doesn't have enough balls. Uh, to fight someone like Justin Gaethje because I think Justin Gaethje will ruin him uh, in front of his whole family and his friends and his fan. And if this is what he want to do to leave on a stretcher, uh, T-Mobile Arena or Madison Square Garden, let it be it. You know, we'll put Neil in a coffin and just send him out of the way. But I believe he using Justin Gaethje for hype. I believe he was offered six, seven times to offer Justin Gaethje and he never, he turned it down. Uh, but now we want to talk about Justin Gaethje. Let's talk now. Let's talk. Do you think, I mean, so do you think it's even worth pursuing? I mean, uh, I know that it, Connor's not your client. Obviously, Michael Chandler's not your client. But I also know that you've got great connections within the industry. So what are you hearing? I mean, is that Connor McGregor, Michael Chandler fight going to happen? Or is this discussion even really worth having? I don't really care. You know, they fight, they don't fight. You know, they did the Ultimate Fighter. Of course, the UFC want to make it happen because they, you know, they have a lot of content from the Ultimate Fighter. They can promote the event. But, you know, Justin Gaethje is the biggest, one of the biggest star, maybe, you know, in the lightweight division today. I believe he should be pound for pound top five before Leon Edward, before Israel Asanya. As a pound for pound, he should be up there because the amount of, uh, of hurting he put on people uh, as, as, as a lightweight, it's it's unbelievable, you know. You, you can't tell me, you know, people will pay more money than him, than Izzy or uh, Edward or some of these guys who are ahead of him in the pound for pound list. I think it should be five top five pound for pound fighter in the world today. Nice. Last thing I want to ask you about Justin Gaethje. You know, he's always said over the last couple of years, he's kind of got this running list of the number of wars that he has left. He knows he can only put his body through so much. Does he keep you posted on that? Like, has he told you, hey, Ali, man, I think we got about three fights left, four fights left. I mean, does he, has he talked to you about that? Listen, he's good to be the lightweight champion of the world. And, and, and I feel, you know, he's uh, this Oliveira. 
and who was forced to fight Islam, by the way. Uh, and I think Islam will beat him. And I think um, uh, you're going to see Justin Gaethje fight Islam Makhachev in Vegas in March sometime next year. And I believe Justin Gaethje is the number one contender. Uh, he's the biggest fight the UFC can make. He's the scariest guy for Islam. You know what I'm saying? And and, and is, is real. You know what I'm saying? He's one of the toughest fights. And I believe that. Habib believe that. And I thought UFC is going to wait and make him fight Islam in Abu Dhabi, but I don't think this year is going to go to Abu Dhabi either. But uh, it worked out the way uh, for everybody, you know. Uh, but Justin Gaethje is one of the scariest guys in the whole UFC, not just uh, not just the, the, the lightweight division. And, and I'm telling you, if this McGregor wanted to leave this part of his legacy, leaving the T-Mobile arena, and an ambulance in a stretcher, let's get it. It's all good. You know, he bring a lot of money, he bring a lot of hype, but I don't think he have enough men in him to take this fight. And I know UFC and Dana said, this guy never turned down a fight and this and that. I think this guy turned down many fights. You know, I think, but you know, Dana's the greatest promoter on the planet and his job is to make guys like him look un invisible. But this guy, he's... You know, I don't believe he's even in the top 25 in the world today. He just have a big mouth, like he's a pound for pound best fighter in the world. But he bring different values. I can't take this away from him. He bring a lot of eyeballs. Yeah. You fight him, you make a lot more money. But sometimes everything is not about money. But if this is what Justin wants, and of course, Trevor is going to make this call. But uh, for me, it uh, doesn't matter. Whatever Justin wants, whatever Trevor wants, the whole team wants. I can try to make it happen, but, you know, and that's about it, about Justin Gish. All right. We'll see how it all plays out. Well, you mentioned Islam Mahashef facing Charles Oliveira in October in Abu Dhabi. Um, I want to ask you about Islam. How is he feeling about this rematch? I mean, is he excited to have this fight again? Because, it's you know, it's it's been relatively quick that we're having this rematch. Is, is he looking forward to it, or is this just kind of, hey, it's work, it's the assignment I got, and I'm just going to go out there and do what I got to do? Islam don't care. Islam, Habib, Islam, all those guys, they, they never turn down fight. They never ask for fight. They never saw who they want to fight. This is what they do. They fight. You understand? They don't They don't care. If this is what it, this is, does somebody have to, if Oliver want to get slaughtered again, no problem. He asked for it. Uh, UFC, actually UFC wanted it. Oliver did not want this rematch. But I think the UFC refreshes memory. He's almost 35 years old. He's never going to get a title shot again. And, uh, and he's in the spot, and I believe, you know, the UFC does a great job to put you in the reality check. And uh, and and they went, go ahead, they went ahead and uh, he said, I don't want this fight, I'm not ready, you know, but in a way, it's, it's, it's who, say no to, who say no to a title fight? He went publicly and said, uh, I like the kid, I like his people, but in a way, fear, and fear also can be good and bad. I believe he's going in there and he know what's going to happen again. I believe it may be worse uh, and Islam is like, man, this is why you got to respect the guys like him. Because many guys said, well, I have to win. I just submitted this guy in two rounds, right? He have nothing to win, but this is his job. I think champion should fight, defend his title against anybody, anybody, uh, anywhere, anytime. And this is what a real champion is. And I think people uh, need to put some respect on Islam's name. He went to Australia, you know, beat up, you know, so-called the pound for pound number one. Uh, come back here, he's going to fight Oliveira again. And after that, he might fight Gaethje, one of the scariest guys on this planet. You know, and this is what a champion should be like. And I believe Justin Gaethje and Islam Mahachar, I think it can be one of the biggest fights of the year. Uh, not only numbers, I think stylistically, Justin can wrestle, uh, he can defend takedowns, Islam striking is improving, power on leave it. And I just think it's, it's, uh, it's entertaining, it's very entertaining, you know. I, I I agree. I think that'd be a phenomenal fight. Let me ask though, Ali, because a lot of people say, well, you know, Alexander Volkanovsky, that fight was great. Let's do another one. Or there's some people saying, hey, you got Leon Edwards and Colby Covington coming up. Maybe Islam wants to go up to 170 and try for a title fight there. Do any of those make sense as well? Or is it Justin Gaethje's the one that's got to happen? Alexander, Alexander, he, he got beat up. He lost. And I like the guy. I respect him. Tremendous. I don't have none, but he lost. He lost on his own home soil. That you know, the ref 
that they should be biased towards him. They, they would all this fan Islam Islam Mahatsha beat him. You know, all these people talk. You know what I'm saying? They never throw a punch in their life. They said he won, he won, he won, he won. Doesn't matter. The judges, the ref, they, the judges, the Australia Athletic Commission, they thought Islam Mahatsha won. I believe Islam won four round, maybe three round at max. Alexander, you have a, a featherweight division. He he kind of defend this title. And down the road, if Islam decided, he will go up. Why well, he need to go down? He already did what, what the FC wanted and he wanted. And because they wanted it, right? And if he keep winning, and long as Kamaru Osman is not the champion or well, is not the champion, if Ryan Adro see the champion, Islam go there and uh, they already have history. You know, they already, you know, they already have history. He beat him up in training before. And I believe he still can beat him up. Right? Remember when Islam Mahachifa went to Australia, he only gained 12 pounds. He walked inside the cage, I think it's 164, 168, some six, something like that. It, you know, it, the weight cut was bad, the recovery was bad, there was only 12 time to recover, and it was a setup. It was a setup for him to win, but he lost. But at the end of the day, uh, not in bad respect for the Alexander Valnowski, I believe he has some work to do. We have uh, Elia Tabor, he have a lot of guys who contender. They deserve to be fighting for the title. Uh, his, his time, Islam will go up. This whole thing, somebody go down and fight him, who cares? You know, but at the end of the day, it's a business. If you make money, it makes sense. And we're always open to make money. Yeah. What do you see for the future of Islam? Because you're mentioning these uh, other possibilities. You know, I, I look at Habib, for instance, right? He ended his career, I think, a little earlier than most people thought they wanted him to, right? I know it was a family commitment. Where does Islam see things? Like, does Islam see himself following a similar path where he gets out early, or does he see, like, Islam, I've got a whole lot to accomplish? Islam is in it to spin it. You know, he, he gonna, he gonna get all the hype, he gonna get all the money. Islam, he told me he hated to win. He's, he was one of the most active champions when he become a champion. He fought five times, I, I believe, in for 15 months or 14 months, right? Bef you know, and he said, next year, Till the UFC, Sean Shelby, Hunter Dana, I want to fight three, four times next year. And I said, okay, no problem. You know, and he'll fight here, and you fight probably, you know, if, if God, if it went well, you fight in March in Vegas, probably, or some, 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 some time. But he'll fight three times next year, hand out. Incredible, incredible. All right, well, listen, talk about USC 291. We saw Kamaru Usman there, super happy for Justin Gaethje after he's went. And I saw his post where he said he was running for the first time in eight years, which I guess that means his knees are better, right? So where is Kamaru right now? And, and you know, what, what do you see as the future of his career at this moment? Man, you can't have a better friend, better brother, better just companion like Kamaru. He, 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 he was so happy, like he won his title back, you know, that show you what kind of great person he is. Kamaru Osman, I believe he's still best welterweight on the planet. I believe he beat Leon. I watched this fight again recently. I believe he beat Leon Edward the last time, and he beat him the second time. He just he lost only one minute this whole time, right? Uh, I believe he still have a run in him. Uh, I just just right now, you know, we need an opponent. We need somebody to smash. And I think it's one guy out there makes sense. You know, they've been in the same era for a long time. Uh, I believe he have a big enough name. I believe Wonder Boy Thompson and Kamaru Osman, that's the fight. You know, but, you know, I'm not the matchmaker. I'm not the UFC. But this is what we're hoping for. Dana and Kamaru, they always on the same page. And, you know, you know and, uh, Dana said you can ask for anybody you want to ask, as long as it's not catch weight. You know, mm -hmm. skin, <laughs> as long as we'll catch weight. And, uh, and I believe Kamaru did enough uh, for the company, and you know, and uh, and if he wanted to fight somebody, I think uh, I think he he should get it. But you know, this is decision I don't make. Like I said, it's people like Dana and these matchmakers and all those they make this decision. But we we this the fight I think we want. I love it. I, love I don't it. know. I don't know if Wonder Boy won this fight. You know, this is a question for him. Uh, him and his team. Uh, especially what happened last weekend, you know. But yeah. this is kind of way we have to Kamaru. I believe Kamaru will fight for the UFC title again. I, I really, truly, uh, I think he is, you know. And, uh, uh, he's the biggest star in the division. He's the biggest name. He's the biggest draw. And uh, I think Kamaru is big business.
Yeah, it's funny. That fight would seem to make sense for Wonder Boy, too, because he said he's trying to get a title shot. So why not try to beat a former champion to get yourself to that title shot? So I think it makes sense. He, he, you, but he, he's not beating Kamaru Usman. Kamaru Usman's going to be the share of their boy. I'm, you know, I, I believe so, too. Uh, like, you know, let's be real. I'm, not, I'm you know, he's, he's like Wonder Boy can do all this stuff. Whatever he does, he cannot do this with Kamaru. I, and I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just being realistic. Uh, I just Kamaru Osman, just you know, he's healthy finally. His body's getting back together. He can run. He can do different things, and I think he's gonna be a problem for a lot of guys. Yeah, it's if he if he wins, I mean, does he end up being a a fan of Colby Covington, like cheering for Colby to maybe beat Leon because maybe it's easier to get another fight with Colby than it would be to get another with Leon? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. At the end of the day, Kamaru. When he become a champion, he kept beating people over and over and over and over and over. And he become a champion, and he's willing to do the same thing, right? But you know, one of the things too, like Camaro, is, is he he pay his dues. You know what I'm saying? He never ask for anybody, and this is you know, and I believe he earned the respect to ask for something like that. And and in a way, listen, if if Wonder Boy wanted, he have to campaign and ask too. And if two guys want to fight each other, it become a lot easier. You know, of course, this is uh, the UFC decision to make this fight. It's not my decisions. I don't act like I know it all or I can do it all, but I can request it all, you know, and I can be annoying and I can, and, uh, and, and, and you know, but at the end of the day, Kamaru Osman, earn, earn, he can ask for fights. It's okay. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, listen, moving on after UFC 291, I saw you back in Vegas at the Association of Boxing Commissions meeting. You were a guest speaker there, and uh, you were talking about the relationship of, of managers and athletes, and you were also there to, to call for greater commission control of tournaments, of course, in that situation with Natan Schulte and Hausch Menfio. So uh, I guess talk to me about that experience. I mean, uh, what was it like for you to be there in front of the ABC, and, and, and what were you hoping to accomplish? First was a was a huge honor to to kind of be the first manager ever to speak at the ABC Commission, and I believe us as managers uh, and fighters, we have so much power, but we don't allow ourselves to use this power. I'm not saying to flex on people. I'm talking about to better our, our athlete uh, career, right? And and let's let's be clear, like none of we don't exist. Promoter doesn't exist. Fighter do, uh, manager doesn't exist. Coaches doesn't exist without the fighter. The fighter is the is the sauce, create everything, right? And I think we, we sometimes we forget we forget how important fighter is the most important thing in fighting because without him is nothing, right? There's nobody bigger than fighters. You know, any promoter will tell you that. Anybody will tell you that. I will tell you that. Let's just keep this uh, clear. Uh, and I believe. You know, I, I believe us as managers, I, I, you know, when I went there in there uh, to this commission meeting, it was, I think it was only Danny Ropstein, right? He was only there. Uh, he's bugging the hell out of everybody. And that's what he's supposed to do, right? And even before I walked in, I said, do you have any question for me to ask on stage? And I did ask uh, his question out of respect, you know? Uh, and I believe, you know, I think we commission and promoter always have a relationship because licenses and this, this, this transaction between them. And I think as managers, we have to have also a good relationship with commissions because a lot of our fighters, they can really rely on their, you know, in the commission's hand, right? And I believe, you know, us as manager, we are competitor, we compete against each other, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of us uh, just don't like each other, include me, you know, they, uh, they try, you know, jump on each other's toes and take each other's businesses, right? You can compete, you know, but I think it should be standard competitions. And I'm a guy who had a huge conflict of interest in the past, right? You know, I was trying to be a promoter and manager, but luckily when I when I made the best decision in my life to be a manager, no, people stopped talking about it. And you have a lot of promoters, managers, it's not in my business, they do whatever they want, but I'm talking about, you know, I think it should be some standards to be a common manager too. I don't think anybody should just go ahead and become a manager. I've been doing this for 20 years, you know. And I think uh, my reputation speaks for itself. I never have an athlete said I did him wrong or, or talk bad about me. Is uh, you know, and, and I'm very proud of that. Very proud of that. And I think we have a lot of great managers, man. And I've you know, I have a group 
uh, managers, we always talk, me, Butler, House, Robustine, we always talk, we always make sure we respect each other's boundaries and stuff like that. And, uh, and uh, I just think we have to do better as managers uh, uh, t t to know where we at, you know. So we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of say so. And the fight, because we represent some of the best fighters in the world. And these fighters have better say so than us, have better control than us. And I'm not saying that to, to smash promoter or promoter to smash us. And, no, we all can work together, but we understand we all where we at, right? We all where we at. And, uh, and I feel, uh, you know, we have a great sport. Uh, we have great promoters, you know, who uh, some of these promoters lose money. That You know, the only f maybe one promotion make money, everybody else lose money. And I, I don't need to, to say who, but in reality, uh, you know, and, you know, I did bring Danny Thatcher to his out because I feel tournament should be regulated by commission. And it's, it's, it's crazy. This something will hit. Tournament is not regulated by submission, you know, and uh, and you know the Tom show situation. I'm in the process to handle it, as I always say. You know, the guys from PFL, uh, they've been my friend for a long time. This is something I started back in the days with WSOF, uh, and I believe good business done behind closed door. Right? There's no need dramas, no, you know this. And at the end of the day, uh, I have to do what's the best for Nishan show, not the best for PFL, but I can do it respectfully, right? And if uh, we met, uh, I met with them with Ray and their lawyers uh, last week, and we're gonna try to figure it out. But at the end of the day, like far as I know, Nathan Schultz should be in this uh, playoffs. I believe he was win, he was favored to win a million dollars, and and he's not. Uh, I believe he should have been there. They don't believe he should have been there, right? We can agree and disagree. This is kind of, but uh, and. Uh, and that's about it. We're going to figure it out. Uh, uh, and I'll leave it at that. I like it. I like it. Well, it's still a, a developing sport, and we're getting better at this as we go along for sure. You mentioned the PFL. I got to ask you. Uh, I know you got a lot going on, but I, I didn't want to let you go without thing, that. I, yeah. I want, I want to thank uh, Mike Mazzoli for really giving me this opportunity uh, to speak on behalf of my fighters, you know, managers, uh, because I'm a guy who people who tried to cancel me for a long time. You know what I'm saying? And I believe uh, he realized my work, uh, Andy Foster uh, came from New York, Mike Mazzoli. The, I work with these people very closely and, uh, and it's an honor to be speaking from them. And uh, I believe they are some of the best commission in the country. I think Mike Mazzoli is second to nothing. And, uh, and for him to involve us as manager to participate in these things, I'm very, very grateful. And it makes me want to do things better, be on the right path, do my job better. Just because when I speak in front of this commission, I have to set up standard. And I, I, I believe this is the standard I have to set. That's awesome. Well said. Yeah, it's progressive right now. Having a manager there, there was a fighter advocate committee for the first time. They're talking about new rules, new sports. So a lot going on there. It's a great time. Uh, I did, I did want to ask you real quick about Kayla Harrison since we're talking about the PFL. Uh, what's the latest on Kayla Harrison? Is she going to fight? I know it's kind of in a, in, a, in a weird situation in limbo. The division's not really there. She's part of the Super Fight pay-per-view division, but we know her contract has like a timer on it. So what's going on with Kayla Harrison? Listen, you know, uh, Kayla Harrison, the deal we signed, you know, uh, PFL had to match. We're supposed to fight two fights in 2023. PFL did everything they can to sign Cyborg to fight Kayla, I believe, in July or August. They couldn't. She played them uh, by doing everything she can she not to fight Kayla. But the, I know they did. And I, I, I promise you, they did really, really hard to try to make this fight. Now, PFL, a little bit run out of time because they got deceived and lied to because Cyborg did not want to fight Kayla. And I, but I know that I know 100% they tried to sign Cyborg. But all along, I told them, hey, she's playing you. You know, she's, but in a way, <laughs> with this whole thing, this, maybe they're going to buy a Bella Tour. She's, she's, she got nowhere to run, right? But anyway, we have, by December 31st, Kayla have to fight two fights. She has no matching cloth, no championship cloth, nothing. She's a free agent. I spoke with Pete Murray. He, is, he's have, he have a fight for her in November. That's what he told me. Uh, 
and we're gonna fight. And in the process, you know, you know, this is Kayla's home. She's zero and zero. This is how she grew up. PFL, uh, you know, they uh, PFL did a lot for Kayla. Kayla did a lot for PFL. It's a great relationship. It's, you know, I can't complain. I'm nothing. You know, they've been nothing but good. And it's gonna be up to Kayla. If this is, she wanna continue with PFL, and this is where she wanna finish her career, or she wanna go somewhere else, right? You know, what's left for Kayla there? If I know the cyborg is gonna fight, I really wanted Kayla to fight cyborg. Stay in PFL, cyborg, make a huge fight, probably early next year. But at the end of the day, this is a business. Uh, I have to see what Kayla wants. Uh, I have to see what other people want, but we always get a deal done on PFL. I, I never once do not get a deal done. We always get deals done, but at the end of the day, um, uh, you know, Kayla's walking around 160, 159, you know, uh, it's not a lot of places for her she can go. Or she had to cut to 135 to go somewhere, right? I don't know if this is possible or not, but I'm looking forward for Kayla to fight in November, uh, uh, PFL final. She's one of the biggest star in PFL. I believe she is the biggest star in PFL, uh, who's actually currently active on the roster. There's nobody bigger, you know. Uh, and I think PFL value her. And I feel the relationship is good. You know, let's see what happens. Fair enough. Well, well, we hope to see her on that November date, and then we'll see what's in her future. Ali, I know you're busy. I can sit here and talk to you all afternoon because you got so many clients and so many busy things going on. But we hit the high points, and we'll talk again real soon and catch up again. It's always an honor talking to you, brother, and it's a pleasure talking to you, and uh, I speak with you soon. Thank you so much, brother.